Sweet, isn't it? Sometimes technology is good. I like that. Uh, well, welcome. My name is Paul Rasmussen. Some who call me Raz because that's much easier than Rasmussen. Um, glad that you're here today, especially if you're a, a visitor with us. Um, you are catching us right toward the beginning of what we're predicting to be about a year and a half journey here. Now that's pretty long to be in something, but uh, what we're talking about is the commands of Christ. So there's quite a few of them, and we don't want to just kind of plow through them, but we want to figure out how we're going to live those out. So that's what we're in, and our series is called Shaping, and I'm going to see how good, of, how good we've done so far. This is only the third week of it, but uh, who's, who's already been in on the first two weeks of this? All right, quite a few of you. All right. Uh, well, then I'm expecting more of you. Okay, so uh, shaping, what, what is the S? Does anybody remember what that is? Strategy. Woo, strategy, you guys are good. What about the H? Humility, Humility right? Because Christ isn't going to ask us to do anything that he himself doesn't do. What's the, hey, put your papers down. What's the A? You cheater. Authority. Authority, that's a good one. All right. Hey, hey, look up here. Now, I see you guys looking down back there. What's, what's the P? What is it? Power. Purity. It's purity. But power's good. That can come with authority. Very good. What's the I? Integrity. Integrity. What's the N? Needy. needy, right? Isn't that? Hold on to that one just for a second. Was Christ needy? Yes. yes. He depended fully on the Father, right? And what's the last one? What is it? Generous, I don't remember what the last one is. Yes, it's generosity. <laughs> very good, generosity, very good. You guys are awesome, way to go. All right, well, we're in the second command of the strategy section of this thing. And uh, before I hit that, let's see how good Dennis was last week. What was the first command within Christ's strategy and commands for reaching the world? What was the first command? Love God. Love God. Right? Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And guess what the one today is? The second is like it. Love your neighbor. Man, woo! You guys are Bible scholars. Wow, I am so impressed. All right, way to go. All right, before I get into that, you know what? I need that handheld back there. Do you guys, I forgot to grab that out. Do you guys have the handheld in the drawer back there somewhere? Before I get into it, uh, this second command... I want to uh, find out if we've got some testimonies from last week because, again, we're going to respond to these. And I know our family met around our table and talked about how do we love God. Um, and so I want to get, you might, I might have to have you guys shout them out because I'm not sure where Mike's at. But what'd you got, what'd, what happened with you guys, Scott? Go ahead and just stand up and share with us a little bit. We're sad, we're and ours was love your neighbor. <laughs> Why didn't you call me, Scott? And, mm. yes, the point was he could comfort them in, in, in nice. the native tongue, which was very special. So we thank everyone for, for this. And we keep, we keep talking about it. 
hockey would keep Awesome. Way to go. Awesome. Wow, that's amazing. Praise the Lord. All right, any other ways we loved God this week did you guys come up with and put into action? All right, we're not going to go to the next. Okay, there you go. Here, let me, let me get this to you. I have a really loud voice. I'm sure I know, we just like to get it on CD. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Diane LeClaire, and I'm a new member to Marymount Community. Uh, my husband my, and I moved here um, in August, and I've been coming to Marymount Church and was coming quite regularly and then stepped away because I am weak and was lazy and didn't want to get out of bed on Sunday and, you know, all those great excuses that we make. And God's been speaking to me and saying, to me, Diane, go. You know, you're not going to have salvation, you're not going to have peace, you're not going to have love, you're not going to move forward where you need to go, which I'm not sure what that is yet, um, unless you go and you become a part of a community, and it's really hard for me. I will also share with you, and it's really emotional, I was, the last time I was here uh, was your healing day, and the young lady who healed my hip, I can't tell you how much pain I was in, and she healed it. Awesome. So I'm back. Awesome. I went to the, um, it's really hard, I went to the um, prayer group last Monday, and you'll have to forgive me, I am really awful with remembering names, but the young lady who sings here was there, and, and um, so I'm committed to coming to the prayer group, and committing my life in an action verb rather than a thought verb uh -huh. to right. being here, and I... I hope that you all embrace my family and I and help pray for my husband that he starts to come with me as well. Thank you. Thank you for loving me enough to welcome me here. Sure, amen. Yeah, all right. Cool. Awesome. Very good. All right, yeah. Part of loving God is absolutely coming in and hanging with the family, right? It's kind of a bummer when God's like throwing a dinner party and then his kids don't show up. So it's awesome. He likes that. What else? Any, any other ways that God called you guys into action and loving him this last week? Onika. Hi, my name's Monica. Um, so one of the things that I've seen this week, really over the last two weeks, I guess, is um, the Lord has really challenged me. He gave me a word for this year. I've been asking him for a word that would basically be like a summation for what he's going to do in the year, which is something one of my friends has done for several years, Chrissy. Um, <clears throat> the word was trial. And I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> That's a fun um, word. <laughs> like, really, I actually cried about it because I was really upset. And um, so when I looked up the definition and I was asking the Lord, okay, what does this mean? The definition that he told me to look at was a... Um, Oh, gosh, now I have to think about it. Uh, <laughs> a test of your faith, perseverance, or stamina by subjection to suffering or temptation. So, um, as you might imagine, huh, difficulty. Um, and in the last two weeks, especially, I feel like the Lord's given me kind of fresh clarity on that. And there's been several occasions where um, he's led me to have some very deep confession and repentance of things that, like, I just had no idea was in my heart. And <clears throat> I really used to think that I was very self-aware about things and that I really loved God with my whole heart. And then in the last two weeks as he's exposed these things, I'm like, dang, that was some stuff that has been in there for like probably two decades, some of it. And that really kind of scares me. But I'm, I felt so refreshed and so cleaned up. Like I had one picture at, after I had um, just spent like an hour confessing and repenting with one of my friends. And it was some really deep old things that I just, again, had no idea were there. <clears throat> and I had this picture of um, my brain, just a normal brain, and Jesus walking through it and literally pulling things out of the deep places and being like, okay, this one and this one, you need to repent of this. This is stuff that is hindering you. And it was just challenging and convicting and it was amazing. And I felt tempted to be like embarrassed that the Lord was showing me these things, but I was so humbled that he would take the time to do that yeah. and show me how to get rid of these things that I could actually love him better and that he was the one who was actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And it was really sweet and like, I so often forget that um, loving God actually means 
recognizing my own sin, the own, my own junk in my life, calling it what it is and saying, yes, this is actually stuff that hinders me from loving Jesus and I need to get it out because mm-hmm. if it's in there, that's way less room for me to love God and for him to fill me up. And awesome. so it was just really, really sweet. And I like, he's refreshed so much in my heart and in my vision for everything in doing that, which is really, really cool. So, awesome. yeah. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet. Okay. My name's Carol Eichert and we... This isn't directly related to having the conversation, but just loving God. I just wanted to share something good that happened to our family this weekend. And Mike, um, so you can rejoice with us. My cousin Sarah came down from Akron, and we attended a a seminar yesterday together. And it wasn't about being a disciple, but she came. we, We had dinner afterward, and she was so struck with how God was speaking to her that she needed to be a disciple and not just believe in God. And um, so she wanted to get baptized. And All we right. tested the pond water at our house, and she said, no way. <laughs> so, and uh, so we used our bathtub upstairs, and we baptized her, and so we were loving God. Woo! Nice. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. And, and, and what's your, was your friend you said? What's her name? Sarah, my cousin. Oh, your cousin. Sorry. Okay, Sarah. All right. Anybody else? They should sit on the front row. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Deborah. Uh, I found in my spiritual journey that the better I get to know Jesus, the more I can love God. That's been really key for me. Awesome. Very cool. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Did somebody else over here? <laughs> no, you do it. Yes, you say. Anybody? Nice. Thanks. Say who you are. Uh, I've always had a problem with like forgiveness. Uh, just you know, being wronged by things in the past and not being able to forgive. And uh, and I'm not even you know was never a perfect person like Jesus was, and he was still able to forgive those who trespassed against him even though he didn't deserve any of it so Mm -hmm. just coming to understand that better that he was still able to forgive people even though he deserved none of it Mm -hmm. really kind of put things in perspective for me sweet awesome yeah absolutely absolutely we love God for absolutely forgiving good that's awesome that's great well let's uh Okay, what we'll do is let's, um, somebody over there that's over there, uh, put, and what's your name who spoke up over here? Carol. Carol? Somebody put a hand on Carol there, and we're going to pray for Sarah, all right? Lord, we lift up, uh, we lift up Sarah to you, and God, praise the Lord that she has decided to really follow you as a disciple of Jesus. Thank you for that. God, I pray for that uh, baptism, Father. I pray for your fire, Father, for uh, that she really would die to herself and be raised up new in Christ. Father, I pray for her to be filled fully with your spirit, Lord, and that she would really walk out from this day forward until she meets you face to face. God, she would really walk out being a disciple of Jesus. Lord, would you bless her? And I come against any plans of the enemy to bring destruction in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And it's Diane. Is it, what's your name? I'm sorry. Say Diane, right? Okay. And would you three ladies right there just put your hand on Diane there? We're just going to pray for her. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in Diane. Thank you for the healing that you're bringing to her physically. But Lord, I'm also thankful that you're not just about the physical healing. Lord, you desire to touch all of who she is, Lord, down to her core and bring uh, wholeness and healing there. I thank you for that, Lord. And we just bless what you're doing. I bless what you're doing in her husband. Father, I ask that you would uh, bring him to just be a part of, of what's happening here or, or in, in any other way that you have, Lord, where you're bringing him into your kingdom activity. So I ask for that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Would you guys stretch out your hand to Monica back there? We're going to pray for her. You guys uh, get a hand on Monica. Lord, we bless what you're doing with Monica. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are bringing her through trials. Lord, I thank you that you're bringing her through 
um, the things, God, that are going to make her stronger in you, Lord, the things that are going to make her a, a tougher warrior, a tougher worshiper in Jesus' name. Father, we bless that. God, I pray that you would continue doing that. And Father, I come against the plans of the enemy to bring destruction into her life. And then, uh, I'm excited, Lord, that I just, right now I'm just even getting a word of just a Navy seal on you. Lord, I just praise you for that, God, that you're doing that in her, Lord. You're going to make her really, really tough and a leader. I'm just seeing a leader on you as well. So we just bless that in Jesus' name. Thank you, God, that you're taking her to that next level. And thank you that you are the kind of father that loves when we bring that prayer to you of, would you make us more like your son? Would you change us? Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Why don't you guys stand up with me? And we're going to read the words up here. If you want to find it in your Bibles, we're looking at Mark 12, 29 through 31. We just stated this pretty much out loud. But if you would, I'd like you to go ahead and read this with me. This is the NIV. Read this with me. It says, the most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart all of your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Thank you guys for honoring God's word. Go ahead and have a seat. Father, we just bless your word in our lives. God, would you go deep with us today? Father, I pray for myself, Lord, that you would release to me gifts of preaching and teaching and prophetic words from your throne. Father, I ask that anything would fall away that's not from you. God, I pray that we'd all have ears to hear today. God, eyes to see, soft hearts for what you have for us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, we're talking about being a loving neighbor today. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, we'll talk that through, but I want to encourage you guys with some stories of being a failed neighbor. And uh, here's my stories around that, and I don't know what the heck God's doing here with, with me and my family, but the first day, we've been in our house now for about, uh, I think it'll be 13 years in April, and the first day that I'm moving into my house, I meet the across the street the old retired Catholic guy that comes walking, walking over to my driveway, and he tells me, in essence, he says, I really like the last guy that lived here because he kept a keg in his garage, refrigerated at all times, and he would always invite me over to come over and have a beer. Are you going to have something like that? <laughs> I said, well, I wasn't planning on having a keg in my garage. It's not a bad idea, but I hadn't been planning on it. I don't think I've talked to him since that day. Well, my neighbor that's down on the corner, I had never met him. When we first moved in, we had a puppy, Lucy the Beagle, and she was a pretty good dog, but beagles can be a little ornery. I didn't know that when we were leaving during the day to go to work and had her out in the backyard, that she was barking and barking and barking. And our house is, it sits like this, is this, if this is our backyard, they were like two houses down on the corner, but their house sat like this. So when they had their windows open or their back door open, all they could hear was my dumb dog yapping and yapping and yapping. But we didn't know that. And so my first experience with that neighbor, Tom is his name, uh, <laughs> I come pulling up in my driveway, and he comes like bolting down the street. Like I'm thinking I'm gonna, we're going to be throwing down in my driveway. I mean, I can tell this guy's like really angry. I've never even met him. He's like, yeah, you just shut that dog. I mean, he, just, he just unleashes on me. And I had no idea that that was happening. So we, we fixed that particular thing. So that was my experience with my neighbor down on the corner. And, and just to make that more interesting, when one of my kids, not Eli, since he's, when one of my kids uh, was about uh, early high school or late junior high, they were jumping on the trampoline outside and they'd gotten hold of one of these laser pointers. <laughs> of course, they had to be shining it down on his TV down, on, down the street. I'm, si I'm sitting in, the, in fact, I'm preaching the next day. I'm si it's a Saturday night because I'm sitting in my robe just kind of reading through my Bible. It's 1030. Caw, 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 caw. Knock on my door. I go down there and he unloads on me again. <laughs> Although I kind of unloaded back on him and we've kind of been friends since. It works with men the way it works with boys as well. Sometimes you have to beat each other up a little bit and then you actually walk away friends. 
So I kind of unloaded on him as well, but now we actually have a good, pretty good relationship. I won't say great, but pretty good. And then my next door neighbor over here, right next door to me, um, when actually it was the same son, I may need to have a talk with him, but <laughs> the same son's mowing the lawn and kind of goes into her yard a little bit. And she went ballistic on us because of, you know, and he was just kind of learning how to mow the lawn. And for whatever reason, whatever happened there, as we, we began to develop some relationship with them, I'll talk about that toward the end. We, we actually are developing good relationship with them. They're not followers of Jesus at all. But uh, so that was my neighbor right next door to me. And then I had these neighbors across the street from me. He's a, he's a policeman. I think she stays at home. And I swear to you, every time we would look them in the eye and wave to them, they'd look down and not wave. I'm like, what the heck, man? We're nice people. What the heck's going on here? So that's, I just want to encourage you that I stand up here as a fellow learner and failure as a neighbor. So I just want to encourage you in that. And uh, I ha we have worked on some of these things, but we'll, I'll talk that through in a little bit. All right, so I'm speaking as one working at it, just like you guys. Now, like the Shema, which is that statement of, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your you know, God with all your soul, heart, soul, mind, strength, etc. Like the Shema we talked about it last week, is Jesus isn't just pulling that out of the air. He pulls that, he's pulling that from the Old Testament. He's actually just quoting from a command from the Old Testament. Well, this is the same, like the Shema. This is in Leviticus 19... 18, and uh, it says this, it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, and it was especially talking about outsiders to the Israelites, but love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. So yes, Jesus did read Leviticus and knew that, but I want to take a look at another story that's very, very similar, and most of us are familiar with this story. If you would, turn in your Bible, if you've got a Bible with you, to Luke 10. In verse 25, if you need a Bible, um, put up your hand, and we've probably got some Bibles here in the back. Does anybody, if anybody needs one, just put up your hand, and we'll, bring, we'll get you one. All right, so it's Luke 10, and I'm reading out of the NIV. Luke needs one for Luke over here. All right. Okay, ten, and, and most of you have probably heard this story in some way or another. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start reading it. It says, on one occasion... An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus' teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. All right, now, again, this isn't that in, in a sense that strange of a debate because there actually really was a debate that was going on among religious leaders I'm going to show you guys a, a graph up here and these uh, the, Sh the Shammai and Hillel were two um, prominent rabbis and so they all you know argued all the time it was, you know what you know what this is this is our similar version of Baptist and Lutheran and vineyard and Episcopalians and whatever. And so they all really wanted to go after God, but they would get into these arguments of what, you know, what this law meant and how do you apply it and what this law meant. And so as you can see up here, they actually had made decisions about who is my neighbor. 
Isn't that crazy? And so, yeah, you can just take a look at that for a second. I like the maybe under Shammai. Maybe the pagan Jew. I don't know. We'll see. But isn't that interesting? So they're actually, this is a real argument that they're having that that wasn't that strange because they would have these kinds of discussions. Now we know that this guy wasn't doing it with a good motive, right? Because it says in the it says in the passage that he was testing Jesus to see what he would say. So let me let's just stay here in the scripture, and I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of the scripture as we move through it. First thing I want to say is this: sometimes these guys who are supposed to be so smart sometimes aren't really that smart. Because to me, when you look at verse 25, I think I would want to test Jesus. I mean, I think they'd been smacked around enough, you know, when you go up to the bully and tweak his nose, it's probably not a good idea. And so, um, you know, in this particular case, Jesus, uh, you know, keeps schooling him. But, you know, I think it's just not a good idea to test Jesus in verse 25 there. But um, Jesus does a really smart thing, which he does in a lot of these conversations, if you'll notice. Look at verse 26. I'm actually, I'm telling you, this is part of a strategy that's actually wise in the way Jesus teaches people and actually in a way that we can share things with one another. It, and sometimes should be our response is, what does he say? What does Jesus say in verse 26 when the guy comes up and asks him a question? He asks him a question back, right? And what's he say? What do you, what's the Bible say? That's what he's saying. What do you, what do you think it says? Well, can't you be my answer, man? See, that's what we want too, don't we? Sometimes. That's a really, guys, let me just share with you. That is a really great strategy for your friends and family and people who come to you. What should I do about this guy that I'm living with? That da, 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 da. Then, well, what's the Bible say about that? I mean, assuming that they're saying that they're fo- trying to follow Christ. You know, I don't know. What's the Bible say about that? What do you think it says? See, when people begin to, when people begin to, see scripture for themselves and see it applied to their lives, then they'll actually take it in more deeply rather than you just telling them that this is how it is or this is how it should be. It allows the Holy Spirit to begin to talk to them about that. We've, we're doing some classes in discipleship here um, where we've been really, lear- we're really learning that as a, even as a staff that if you let the Holy Spirit show people stuff, it goes to a much deeper level. So you see this happen a lot if you see the different confrontations that Jesus has. He'll do that often. But he asks the guy, so well, what do you think it says? You know, you're, you're schooled. You understand what, what it says. So he asks him that in verse, 20, uh, verse 26. So then we go um, down to verse 29. And something happens here that I have to admit way too often I do. When, when, when God, and I don't think I'm probably the only one in this room. Maybe I am because you guys are super holy. But often when God's super clear on something, what do I like to do? I like to try to figure out a way around it. I like to justify it. I'm gonna, well, I mean, you don't mean like on Thursday nights because I'm really busy on Thursday nights. So I don't, <laughs> right? I mean, right? So this guy isn't the only one trying to justify himself, right? Okay, so this is a, so we have here, he, he says, you know, he, he's doing what we all do. He's trying to justify himself. And what he's really saying, I think to Jesus, he's saying, can you give me the rules so that I can figure out how to get around them? That's why we like the laid out rules, I think. That we always want to move back. I think we always want to move back toward um, sort of a legalism. Just lay out the ten rules for me so I can make sure I'm obeying them. But, but it can be, I can obey them fully and have a crappy heart, can I? I mean, that's what it says even in Corinthians. It says you can go feed the poor. You can, you can uh, fast and pray. You can do this and this and this. But if you do it without love, you're like a resounding gong. I mean, there are all, you know, all kinds of things. We know that. We know that. If you've been in this thing for a while at all, trying to follow God. Uh, so he's just saying, Jesus, lay out the rules for me. Let me make sure I'm following them. Okay? Much like the rich young ruler. Remember that story? It was a similar story. Right? He says to him, hey, what do I need to do to get saved? And, and once again, Jesus says, well, what do you think? <laughs> so well, I followed all these commandments. Oh, that's a good thing you followed all those commandments. Now go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, right? It was a test of his heart. Now, this, this, uh, in this description, again, that Jesus is using this story, again, could have been a very real story because um, the trek down from Jerusalem to Jericho is about a 17-mile trek, and it's about... It's, it's about a 3,000 foot uh, descent, uh, uh, you know, throughout that, throughout that mileage. And of course, in that time, and I, I, don't, I haven't seen it, I've never been to Israel, so I don't, I don't know what it looks like now. But it was, I think in my mind, I see it as similar to kind of like the Old West. You know, it was uh, a windy, 
path. It was a, you know, a lot of rocks and crags and you know, all kinds of foliage around there. So basically, there would be criminals that would hide out and look for somebody to pounce on who was weak and steal from them and so on. So again, this wouldn't have been too weird of a story that Jesus is sharing here with his listeners. Now, the part where Jesus kind of gets tough with them is, of course, and he's been known to do this, he uses people like me and Dennis and Zach and other staff here, and he says, well, then there's the pastor guy from MCC, and he's walking down the road going to probably do a Wednesday night service somewhere. And and I picture this as he's saying it. I picture, and, and you know what, have you guys ever done this with like a homeless guy down in Cincinnati? I love it. You guys are already shaking your head. Yeah. Like they're coming towards you and you're walking. You're like, I think I'm going to pass over on the other side. You know, that's what I picture. Don't you picture that? Right. He's walking and he's and right there's the, the wounded guy. So he's like, I think I'm going to cross over here. I don't see anything. Right. And so the priest who's like our priest today, just that terminology was the one who cared for people. He was supposed to be the one that would care for people's needs. And then a Levite was a one who was from Levi, but not a full blown priest because he would help the priest because he wasn't from Aaron. So they were like the helpers in the temple. They helped with, you know, all the religious stuff that they were doing. Now, I can kind of give them a little bit of space because, you know, they have all these rules and regulations around, you know, getting blood on them and, uh, you know, all these other things that would defile them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Jesus brings that up and challenges those that are like me. And others who sometimes are so busy doing God's business that we're not really doing God's business. And uh, so I'm always convicted when I read this. But then it's interesting. Then Jesus brings up the Samaritan. And we see Jesus deal with Samaritans a lot throughout. Because the Samaritans were absolutely hated by the Jews. Hated by them. They were were half-breeds. They were half-Jewish, half-Gentile. And they uh, absolutely could not stand them. And so, of course, <laughs> Jesus throws a little fuel on the fire to test hearts. He says, okay, and then this third guy comes by, and he's a Samaritan, and this is what he does. And, of course, it's obvious, you know, what happens there. And so what I want to do, though, is I want to really look at the Samaritan and his heart and what it took for him to care for this person. And my challenge to us today, as, you know, as we're kind of moving through this, and just to think about is what will it take for us to obey Christ's commands? What changes will it take to our lifestyle and to our lives to begin to obey Christ's commands? You know, there's a reason that the home makeover show did so good for so long. We like those kind of stories. And everybody likes that ideal of the missionary that goes on the field. But what have people really done in their life to have to align themselves to be able to do that? Let's take a look just even in the small story that Jesus lays out. The first thing I see with this guy in verse 33 is he has to give emotional energy, empathy for this guy. So he has to give emotionally to this situation. He feels sorry for the guy. And he also, think about this, has to give forgiveness. Okay, if we can better align this up, this would be like a Catholic or, you know, a, a, a Catholic Irish and a Protestant Irish, right? Or if we're back in the, you know, early 1900s here in Mobile, Alabama, you know, it's the white guy that's beat up on the side of the road and the black guy that comes and takes care of him. So you'd have to see how they, he would not only have to be empathetic, but he would have to be willing to give forgiveness because he knows he's caring for a person that has been taught to hate him. Right? So, the second thing I see there is he's willing to get his hands dirty. This is good stuff. You know what I'm right? He's willing to get his hands dirty. Right? He goes, says he begins to the best of his knowledge of being able to do bind the man's wounds. You know, uh, we don't know everything that he did there in this story. Third, he gives up his own comfort. Remember, it says that, you know, he, I told you, how long did I just say that trek was? How many miles? 17 miles, right? How was he riding that trek, right? He was on a donkey. He was doing all right. But it said that he took the man and put him on his own donkey. So 
I don't know where it was on that. It could have been 10 miles. It doesn't matter. It's not, I mean, it's not a, it isn't a real story that happened. Jesus is just sharing this story, right? But you get the idea. The man has to give up his own comfort. Are we ready to do that to love our neighbor, right? And maybe walk the rest of the way. The other thing is, is he gives up his own money. Right? I mean, I don't know if the guy was rich or the guy was poor, but maybe he was like planning on eating dinner, you know, or lunch. You know, maybe that was his, his money for the next day for food, but he wasn't going to be able to eat because he gave it to the, you know, whoever the doctor was there to take care of him. Right? The innkeeper there. All right. So he gave, he, so he gave of his own personal resources. And this is a big one, guys. And this was, this one I, I point back at me for sure is time. I really believe time is the commodity of our generation, of this just everything. We're almost, willing, I, we're almost willing to give up pretty good amounts of money just not to have to deal with using my time. We're, we're willing to do all kinds of things sometimes, not to give our time. But he laid down his schedule. I don't know where he was going. I don't know what he was doing. But I'm telling you now, I cannot love my neighbor. I cannot love God unless I arrange my life and my lifestyle and my time and my schedule in order to do that. And it's not going to magically happen because I have a thought about it, right? Is there anybody here who owns a, a, I don't know, an elliptical machine in their house, right? Anybody or something like that? Come on. Give, come on. Help me out here. And how many hours do we hit that thing a day? Right, we all, we all know we all know, right? What it takes to get in shape. It's a good idea. I keep thinking I'm going to lose weight if I just think that I'll align my diet better. And I'm thinking I'd like to work out seven days a week. I cannot understand why the weight's not coming off when I only work out two days a week and I eat anything I want. Okay, we have good motivation, but the truth is, time. He had to lay down his schedule. Now, let's look through these again. Emotional. Energy, empathy, forgiveness, dirty hands. He gave up his own comfort, his own personal resources, his time. Who does this sound like? Who else does this sound like in Scripture? Yes, it's the Sunday school answer. Give it to me. Jesus. Jesus. Yes, you can give that one this time. It is the Sunday. It is Jesus. You understand Jesus was fine hanging with the Father and Spirit. He was fine. You know, God does not need you. He does not need me. This was a plan there of redemption, right? This is just an example of Christ. That's, all, that's what he's showing here, right? We want to look like Jesus. That's what he looks like. That's why Jesus says to him, remember what Jesus says? This is a weird promise tagged on to this, right? He says, right, go do this and what? He says, you'll live. Go, ahead, go do the same thing and you'll live. And I think part of what's embraced in that is living the life that's truly life. One of my favorite just quotes from the Bible, if we walk with God, we live the life that's truly life. Monica may be going through some hard things as she's being developed, but when we walk in Christ, it becomes an adventure. It becomes, we become more human in how we're supposed to be. We become more like God in how we're supposed to be. And so he says, go and do the same thing. And guess what? You'll live. Is there anybody in here that's ever struggled with depression? Or you're struggling with, wow, I don't, you know, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I don't, you know, and you just, and, and, and you, you just feel awkward in this life. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? And so on. You know, I mean, we've all, we've all struggled with feelings like that and things like that. But I think that's part of what Jesus is challenging him here. Hey, be obedient to the Father. Go and do these things and you'll live. You'll really live. You'll get into the adventure. Now, why is this so important to God? If you really align this and thought about this, when Jesus quotes this, again, I mean, we understand. I mean, I think most religious people, followers of Christ or not, uh, Muslims would say the same thing, would recognize loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is super important, right? But recognize that Jesus is saying the second one is just like it. Grab that now. It's just like it. Wait a minute. Aren't these just broken people that we're supposed to be? Yes, it's just like it. Why? Why? Because loving others, you love what the Father loves. You love what the Father loves and cares about. By loving others, you're loving the lost. You're loving the broken. You're loving his children. You're loving his creation. You're loving the ones that he deemed worthy to give his son. Think about that for a second. When you love that neighbor, you're loving the ones 
that he thought worthy to give his son in sacrifice. Now, one more thing. How does it say for those who, and some of you may be in here or aren't following Christ yet. That's awesome. That's cool. I mean, wherever you're at in this path, I pray that the Lord will speak to you today in this. But now I'm speaking to those who are following Christ. Those of you in here who are following Christ, how will those outside of Christ know Christ is for real? By our what? Our love for one another. That is why it's just like loving the Father. Guys, do you understand how broken the Father's heart is over the broken? The smelly homeless person who's not following Christ that you know, or the executive that's, that doesn't know Christ. The Father's broken for them. And how many times have I heard, I've got, I've got ad nauseum videos and books in my, in my office on this, ad nauseum. How many times have you heard, you know, I like the idea of Christ, but man, his church, ooh. Have you ever heard that? Right? I, I like God. I like Jesus, but I don't like people who call themselves Jesus followers or Christians. I, I, that just breaks my heart. Because the Father's made it clear. He said, you know what? These people will be totally drawn as you love one another. Right? Doesn't that happen in Acts as they give their lives for one another? The people just kept getting added and that and that. Who doesn't like a community like that? Who doesn't like Gladstone community? I love you guys. So, I mean, people are drawn to those who love, right? Now, when you, when you go into your work this week, do you like to hang out with the guy around the coffee? Maybe you're that guy around the coffee pot that's like, you know, I hate life. You know, did you see what happened on the news? That really bit. I hate the president. I hate, I hate everything, you know. I, I don't like hanging out with people like that. I don't like being a person like that, which my wife sometimes points out that I am. And, uh, but, you know, you want to be around that person who's loving and caring, right? I'm actually loving God by loving others. Say that with me. I'm loving God by loving others. That's good stuff right there. I am actually loving God by loving others. It says, when you care, right, for the least of these, you what? You've done it for me, right? So what is the command? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the command. Jesus says, do this and you will live. And he says to the, the guy in this story of the Good Samaritan, he says, go and do likewise. Do what the Good Samaritan did. Well, that's a nice thought, Paul. How am I going to do that? You might have to rearrange your time, your money, get your hands dirty, right? All right, I'll, begin, I'll tell you how we begin, we begin to break through with our neighbors, okay? Really simple, you guys, super simple. When it snowed, our next door neighbors to the left of us who got mad about their lawn, they both uh, struggle physically. He has um, really bad diabetes. And so for one, one winter, every time I, we would go out, whether it was me or the boys, whether we'd go out and do our um, driveway, we'd just do their driveway too. And then in the summer, I started to just do their lawn out front as I was doing my lawn. It's not a big deal, but it took me some time. I had to get a little bit dirty. You know, I'm, you know, I'm getting old, so I hurt my back a little bit. <laughs> but you know what? All of a sudden, guess what happens at Christmas time? She comes over with homemade cookies. Sweet. Yeah, dog. Totally worth it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> totally worth it. Here, I want to share. We're, I'm almost finished here. I want, to share a, I want to share a story with you. Maybe you guys have heard, heard this. It was first, I think it was first caught on uh, one of the ABC affiliates. Of, of, I think of wonderful application of this, of loving your neighbor. Here's a story. A, name, a lady named Renee Walston's incredible act of kindness follows a blog post published a few months ago by Emily Colson, daughter of the late Christian leader Chuck Colson. Here's what happened. Colson wrote about a horrific experience during which she, her stepmother, and her 23-year-old son Max, who was autistic, were jeered and yelled at by fellow moviegoers until they left the movie theater. One man even called Max retarded as the crowd applauded at their exit. After hearing the traumatic story, Walston, a mother of three, decided to take action and create an event called Movie with Max. 
Walston is renting a local Regal Cinema on March 27th to show Muppets Most Wanted to nearly 300 kids, many of whom have special needs. As Christians, we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves, Walston said. I just thought that if that were my child, I would have to find a way to make this right for him. At first, she only rented a 94-seat theater as she wasn't sure how people would respond to the event. But now, a movie with Max is sold out of tickets for a 294-seat space, and the event will likely be held again. Isn't that an awesome story? She just thought, that would break my heart if that happened to my child. So how can I respond to that? She gave her resources, her time, talent, everything. Um, I'll tell you what we're gonna. What I want to do is let's just invite the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I don't. Again, I, we want. I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you guys in this. Not honestly, not me. Um, what I want to do is, if you're here with someone, you know what? And never mind on that. I just want to do this individually. Okay. What I want, what I'd like to do is really ask the Holy Spirit. As Monica was sharing with us, sometimes you know our hearts are wicked. I mean, it's, that's the truth. You know, we don't even know our own motives sometimes. And um, what I want to do is let's confess to the Lord any areas that he shows us where we've committed what I call just sins of omission, where we've just stepped to the other side of the road, however you want to put that, okay? And uh, we're going to ask the Lord about that. And so, and then if there's things within that prayer that God just shows you real specifically, you know, to do and you've ignored it, you know, pray about that and ask the Lord to forgive you for that. And he's faithful to forgive you. If you're not a follower of God yet, then, you know, maybe take this time to ask the Lord to begin to show you if he's real or not, you know. But if you are a follower of Christ, let's, let's just do that. Um, I'm going to put these up here, actually. Um, I think I have these here, uh, Emily. Let's put those up. Is, uh, and then two, let's flip that and then recommit to the Lord that we're willing to give to him in these areas. And you know what? Even as I speak about these things, some of you might not be there. I mean, some of you are like, man, I don't know if I can give my money to these things. I don't know if I, I'm willing to change my lifestyle to love my neighbor. Then ask the Lord to motivate you in that. Listen, guys, any of these commands that we go through, and you're going to hear this week in and week out, any of these commands we go through, you cannot accomplish. Do you understand that? You cannot accomplish it. The disciples asked Jesus a good question one time. He said, well, gosh, if this guy's got it made in the shade, obviously God really loves him, then who the heck can be saved? He says, nobody. This isn't something you can accomplish on your own. It has to be Christ living through us. So we're going to ask, we're going to repent, basically, of areas of omission, if you're willing to do that. And secondly, recommit to the Lord that you'd like to follow through on these things. Would he fill you and help you do that? And so on. So I'm going to let you do that just individually. Ben, why don't you guys go ahead and come on up? So, number one, I want you to pray and just ask the Lord, God, show me areas of confession where I just need to confess sin to you, where I'm not doing these things and loving my neighbor, loving my weird brother-in-law or whatever it might be. And then secondly, God, would you empower me to do this? Empower me to do this. All right? So that's what we're going to do. Now, when you feel like you've gotten right with God, you feel like you're ready, we have communion tables set up on either side. So just go up and take communion on your own. You just get the bread and dip it in the the juice. And um, so when you're ready to do that, just go ahead and go up on your own and do that. Um, and then I just want to encourage you, if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, then don't, don't do the communion thing. It won't make sense to you because you, you haven't received what Christ did for you on the cross. So don't, it's you know, best that you don't do that. But just uh, sit and reflect and ask the Lord to show you his love for you as his father. Okay? So I'm just going to let you guys do that. I'm going to do that too, and then we'll worship here a little bit.